and we're live. Uh, welcome back everybody from the break. Thank you for joining uh, this next session with us uh, entitled Privacy Marketing and the Privacy Tech Startup. My name is Melanie Ensign. I am the founder and CEO of Discernible, which is a cybersecurity and privacy communications advisory firm. I'm also an advisor to the rise of Privacy Tech. Really excited to see everybody who's shown up today to participate uh, in the community. I previously led security, privacy, and engineering communications for Uber. I've done security communications for Facebook and AT&T, uh, and now really focused on helping other companies hone their security and privacy narratives, talking points, and really uh, bringing out the authentic um, investments and commitments that they're making in this space. So I am very honored today uh, to be joined by Kate Parker and Casey Myers. I'm going to ask the two of them to introduce uh, themselves to you, uh, starting with Kate. Uh, tell the folks a little bit about who you are, uh, what you're working on in this space, and how you're thinking about privacy and marketing as it relates to um, privacy tech startups. Wonderful. Well, it's great to be here. And thank you, Melanie and Casey. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I am Kate Parker. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Transcend. We are a data privacy infrastructure company that helps companies around the world be able to quickly and accurately assess and work on data privacy issues. Um, we're an engineering-led company. I um, I'm a marketer by trade. I spent my first year as a head of marketing for Transcend, and prior to that, I was the global director of marketing for Uber um, for consumer safety, which was our was our top company priority. I'm a um, product marketer, uh, formerly from Google, as well as a tech diversity uh, leader, sitting on boards of a global education and AI nonprofit, uh, Technovation, and spend quite a bit of time thinking about how we build consumer trust. And that's what I'll be bringing into this conversation today, um, particularly as it relates to data privacy. We spend a lot of time talking about what that means from a consumer trust angle. How do we build consumer trust? How do we break consumer trust? And what role does privacy play in all of this? Um, consumer trust obviously means a lot of different things from ethics to business practices, to the quality of the product. But where is privacy in all of that? And that's something that we'll unpack and discuss a little about in this conversation. So it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Kate. Casey? Hi, I'm Casey Myers. I'm the Director of Grad Studies and an Associate Professor at the School of Communication at Virginia Tech. And uh, I'm an attorney by trade and also a scholar of uh, public relations and communication laws that relates to privacy and communication practice. And what I want to talk about today is the role that privacy plays kind of in reputation management and some of the ethical values and ethical issues that have presented themselves uh, and how that kind of those societal demands and those ethical demands may be leading the law as it goes forward. And some of the talking about some of the things that we are dealing with currently within the privacy sphere, such as uh, data collection, European Union regulation, but also what's on the horizon in privacy? How does privacy get used as a um, as an expectation for consumers, and how and how that conversation is driving legislation and regulation going forward into the 2020s? And then kind of looking at some of the things that are going on both internationally and in the United States in terms of privacy law and how that's evolving to deal with new technological phenomenons, but also new phenomenons such as the global pandemic that we've been through in the last year and a half and how that also relates to privacy as well as it presents new and uh, unexpected um, uh, needs on part of privacy and part of uh, consumers as well. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for, for joining us. I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, I want to start by giving folks a little bit of context about why privacy, um, and we could even go broader into data protection um, for our GDPR folks that don't use the term privacy, uh, it, why it is so important um, for functions like ours, whether it's communications or PR, marketing, reputation management, why has privacy become such an important topic for us? Um, and I would invite you to, to think about that in terms of um, the 
think that privacy has on a broad brand reputation uh, and, and a company's uh, brand value, but also the importance of having a, rep a specific reputation for privacy and respect um, of consumer privacy. So, um, Kate, let, let's start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the good news is the answer is quite simple here, or at least from my vantage point it is. And it's because consumers are telling us that privacy matters. We're seeing studies after studies, and I know folks joining us in this conversation and listening in have probably all read and seen various points of research, but people are saying that they want to switch to companies that prioritize privacy. They feel frustrated by the fact that they don't have control or agency over their personal data. We're also starting to see and from a marketing perspective, we talk a lot about brand attributes, which means how do people feel about my brand? What are sort of the associations that are coming up? And when people hear about privacy related issues, they're thinking about things like untrustworthy, lazy, unethical. Um, when they see things in the media, when they encounter practices that feel, um, you know, creepy is a word that comes up quite a bit from a consumer angle. And so these are all consumer led insights that companies are seeing and feeling. And in the marketing department, as well as in the public relations department, consumer insights are your lifeblood. That is what is your first sort of telling sign as to what matters for your industry and for your company. And increasingly, and it's really picking up pace, we're seeing more and more folks care about privacy, which means that as marketers, we have to care about privacy as well. We need to understand how our brand is actually showing up with the control and usage and respect of, of data and how our consumers are thinking about that from that angle. So I always start from there. I start with the fact that it really is consumer led. And I think that's an important piece um, for marketers that brings them into this conversation, at least to start. Great, thanks. And, and Casey, wow. from your perspective, I know, oh, go ahead. No, go, please. I was going to say, I know, uh, you know, from, from both a legal perspective, but also from, um, you know, a scholar and kind of a, as a um, scholar of marketing and, and public relations, um, is what we're seeing now significantly different beyond the consumer trends um, that Kate mentioned? Is there something else happening within the industry, within the profession? Um, that is driving the importance of privacy to reputation as a whole. So I think that, that Kate is absolutely correct about consumer driven requests for privacy and consumer expectations of privacy. And if you look at sort of decision making in the market, so people make decisions about where they're going to purchase products and services, what companies are they going to interact with? We know that company values are now very important on a lot of different levels for people making decisions about how they're going to spend their money, who they're, what companies they're going to support, what companies they are not going to support. And I think if we were to go back, you know, in history, we look at things like in the past, there's been this expectation uh, where, you know, is this product a quality product or not a quality product? Is this product uh, going to be delivered on time if I'm, I'm using a catalog or online uh, purchasing. And now we're seeing a new expectation. In addition to those expectations is, is my, how is my privacy going to be protected and how is my data going to be used? And if you look at it, there's really two issues. You know, there's the issue of data collection and then data usage. And I think that there's an, also a greater awareness of people that, you know, data is going to be collected. But I think there's a greater concern out there of how is my data going to be used? And you can you look at the, the trends, if you look at the trades, you look at the you know, academic studies, we know that early adopters of products and services usually are, are people that are trendsetters. You know, it seems that a lot of those people today are looking at privacy along with, you know, product quality and service quality and that kind of thing as part of their decision making process. So if that is the case and that that makes privacy uh, uh, the central part of really the identity and the and the the quality of, of of any kind of goods or services that are being sold in the marketplace. So in that sense, you know, it's it's part of reputation management and is part of the expectation that people have because there's a greater awareness of it and there is a greater um, a, a greater a higher level expectation uh, on privacy rights and privacy storage and usage. 
Yeah, and it's interesting that you met, you bring up kind of the early adopters um, uh, increasing their literacy and, and interest um, and concern uh, for privacy uh, because it, it brings to mind the importance of having good privacy as part of an MVP version of any product. Privacy has historically been something that gets built in later on as the market demands more or um, you know, companies feel pressure from various stakeholders or, or advocates. And what you're suggesting then is that if, if even early adopters are looking to privacy as an indicator of these broader things about a company and a product, um, that it really is something that should be considered for, you know, that initial beta um, and not something that, you know, is it a V2 or a V3 consideration. Uh, and so, Kay, I, I want to... Um, circle back with you quickly um as a can i call you a former marketer are you a recovery <laughs> marketer are you still a marketer, marketer. <laughs> yes still a marketer yes, um, a recovering marketer as somebody with marketing expertise um why do you think that you know marketing often is like daryl like in privacy like it, is there actually a natural tension between those two things or is this perhaps a false dichotomy no, I think there there absolutely is a tension. Um, and it's fascinating for me as someone who has studied consumer trust in a variety of different topical areas to watch what is very different about privacy than something like consumer safety or tech ethics, et cetera, more broadly, or just product safety. Within privacy, the issue that we have is that marketing as an organization is actually built on and held to success standards based on the use of consumer data. A marketer's ability to be successful in many ways relies on what we now more traditionally call growth hacks. The ability to find as quickly as possible the consumers who have expressed any interest in anything related to anything that you might be selling and putting them through a very um, specific and sophisticated funnel in order to get them to purchase or interact with your company. All of those mechanisms are based on the sophisticated use of consumer data. And so what's happening with privacy in a really interesting way for us all to think about how we interact more broadly with companies that are starting out on their privacy journey is that while marketers care very deeply about consumer trust, and it would make sense that de facto they would care about privacy, they're getting mixed messages internally and they've got a misalignment of incentives because it becomes very challenging to prioritize and champion the changing of company practices. And that fundamentally means you're talking about prioritizing and changing the very practices that determine whether or not you are good at your job and are going to stay in your seat or be promoted or hit your bonus or get your org the right resources. And that's frankly what what's sort of in this very messy nest of privacy and something I think we need to talk a little bit more about and how, how we bring marketing along in the privacy journey because it won't just be in talking about consumer trust. Even though obviously I feel deeply about that, we all feel deeply about that. It's not enough until marketers have the tools that they need and the shifts that happen culturally across the company so that they're not held to success metrics that depend on the very practices that we want them to shift and alter and change. And that really is a CEO and board level discussion that needs to happen in terms of ethics and governance and what the standards are um, to let those marketers succeed with sort of changing um, direction in terms of the adjustment of consumer data. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it explains a lot of the, the dark, dark patterns that we see um, across the web and in mobile apps as well, because marketers are so reluctant um, to let go of that data um, because they are already, they are pre-committed to certain metrics um, with the C-suite. Um, and so it, it is not surprising that we see so many companies dragging their heels in terms of transparency, choice, um, and user respect. Um, in case I want to shift gears a little bit um, and talk to you a little bit more in terms of, you know, what is legally required um, 
for privacy and data protection versus the ethics and the public expectations. Um, so in terms of cultural norms, how they're driving the law, um, how do you kind of uh, think about all of this? You know, as we're talking about reputation, nobody gets at trophies for hitting the legal minimum, right? Uh, you have to, the only way you can grow a reputation, um, a strong one in privacy is to go above and beyond uh, what's required. And so how do you think about the legal requirements versus, you know, the, these new expectations around ethics? Right, so the legal requirements, as the name suggests, are required. I mean, there's no option not to do that. But the question is, is so there's maybe a difference between mandatory minimum standards and maybe expectations ethically, maybe consumer expectations. And I think one of the things that Kate was talking about a minute ago, where we're, we're dealing with this issue of, okay, well, how we, we've got data analytics that we can use, but we also have, you know, privacy concerns. And I think what the, what creates such a tension now is that there isn't, that we're in a state of flux. We are in a state where there's an increased awareness of privacy concerns. There's all of this data that's available that people are using for analytical purposes that is uh, effective. I mean, that's why it's, it's, it's so valued. And then we have the law that's sort of catching up with this at the same time. And then in a multinational corporate uh, environment, you have different expectations by country. So you have a very robust privacy laws by Europe and GDPR, you have some American states that are stepping in, creating their own sort of GDPR-like state statutes, and then you're, you as a company are trying to, to go through this. I think when you have this summit in 2025 or 2030, you know, it's going to be a very different conversation because there's going to be more established norms. Now, in terms of going above and beyond in the ethical component, I think that, you know, like I said, you know, consumers, uh, they, they live on a continuum between, you know, being totally off-grid and being totally full disclosure. And most people live in somewhere in the middle of that. And I think as awareness increases, I think as, and also uh, as, as, as problems uh, awareness emerge. So people are aware of maybe data breaches or they're aware of misuse and that, and that drives that kind of, those types of consumer concerns drive the political discussion. And that political discussion materializes in laws and regulations. And I think when we're looking at expectations, I think as as we are entering in the 2020s, I think that the awareness of privacy and the awareness of data usage, storage and uh, collection is such that we're, we're, we're entering a phase where those mandatory minimums may shift upward to be even more robust. And I think that there may be uh, a room for companies to maybe distinguish themselves in terms of reputation for being good stewards of private information. And I think that's what a lot of the expectations are amongst consumers in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Kate, kind of building on that, can you talk a bit about how you view um, brand building um, as, well, I know you and I have talked about this uh, before, mm -hmm. but um, can you share your thoughts about um, in the, the privacy tech um, landscape in particular, we're, mm -hmm. we're seeing, and understandably so, privacy companies using um, the ability for marketers and engineers and lawyers, you know, the privacy professionals to build brand value and brand trust through privacy efforts. Um, can you talk about you know, kind of the um, circumstances where that may work and where it may not work, given the fact that, I mean, you're essentially telling us that there's a huge uh, hill that we need to overcome within marketing departments. So how are the lowly privacy professionals supposed to be building, you know, brand um, with, you know, some, some automation tools? Yeah, it's, it's such a good question. It's something that's on my mind a, quite a bit because for the folks in the trenches of privacy, it's going to feel very slow, this evolution. It probably already had, I'm probably already summarizing, you know, decades of, of feelings that already exist within the privacy community. My belief is that it will take off. This fire will ultimately kind of start and continue with brand trust because it has all of the attributes it needs, starting with the most important, which is whether or not consumers care about it. 
And wherever that is present, that is going to be a catalyst for change. But in this period, and to use Casey's term, which I love, which is this, this period of flux and change that we're in right now, we need to be careful and considerate of our audience and who we're talking to. And, and I don't mean we need to tread lightly, but I mean we need to be thinking about the pressures that they might be under. So for a message around brand trust to take off with a company, there probably needs to be quite a bit of factor. You probably need a marketer who is not being held to growth standards by their CEO or their board that make it nearly impossible for them to change or alter any of their current structures in a way that might be more privacy um, sort of preserving, but is um, different than the legal regulations, right? This sort of gray area in between those spaces. The other thing that we need to consider is that we have to invite marketers into the conversation in a way for them to self-reflect on what might need to change within their organizations in order for a story or a narrative around privacy and brand trust to make sense. Incentives is a big piece of that. But also to draw upon your example, it could be as small as the examples of the way that we're setting up our websites. Are we so held to specific data collection that we have somehow created incentives for our designers, for the folks who are just making the, the buttons and the logo and the, and whether or not it is clear that data is being collected. So inviting some self-reflection into that process, I think is critically important. And then understanding that a company is not gonna start overnight with a brand trust campaign or an issue or a bold statement without some serious reflection of how that might impact every node and touch point throughout the company. And that's true beyond privacy. I mean, you look at any type of issue that a company wants to tackle, whether it's sustainability to, you know, taking a stand on a, a different societal issue, a company is going to do a very thorough 360 review to say what's working for us in being a leader on this topic and what's working against us. And if that against us column, that could be internal practices, things they need to clean up, places where there's no clear owner, places where there's a lack of resource or investment, that's what's going to rule the day in terms of the decision of whether they want to go out and hang their hat on this issue. And so we need to be helpful in cleaning up the what's working against you column before we start championing and creating pressure for them to go out as champions because everyone needs to protect their backside or their blind side in this issue. And that's where we can be most helpful um, in communicating what brand trust could look like. Yeah, also, it, oh, I was just gonna say super quickly that I think there's in a, uh, to leave on a positive note, when the big players like Apple and others take strong consumer oriented marketing stands, that helps to open the door for the conversation with other companies because people see those commercials, they see that interaction, they see people responding positively to it. Um, so there is sort of this give and take between consumers. It's like this little catnip that's like, oh, that looks interesting. People seem to be responding well to that. And that might invite further conversation as well. It's interesting when you, you mention um, kind of the the things that cause hesitation, right? And the fact yeah. that uh, particularly in very competitive markets, um, nobody wants to cut off access to that data before their competitors do. Um, and so it's one of the areas where I think regulation can be the most helpful in leveling the playing field is, you know, oftentimes the line that companies are not willing to cross is where their competitors are. Um, to cut off access to intelligence um, or insights that their competitors are going to continue to have, but they won't have, um, is often something that trips up internal privacy conversations, especially when we're talking to marketers about, you know, it's actually really sketchy that you're doing this. Well, but all of our competitors are doing it and it's how they're competing with us in, in certain areas. Um, and so 
you know, it's interesting to me that so many of our existing privacy laws, and Casey, I would love your input on this. So many of our privacy laws seem to be in response to very large tech companies who don't have as much competition as other companies. Um, and so the laws don't always consider the fact that the law needs to be um, universal in terms of um, cutting off those problematic practices from everybody in the market. Um, because if, if it's only affecting one industry, one sector, it's so easy for a competitor to pivot um, and they still have access to those problematic practices that, that you've stopped doing. Um, and that makes everybody hesitant um, to make these big systematic changes that need to happen. Uh, so Kizzy, I'm just kind of curious your perspective um, in terms of how, how should we be thinking about competition with regards to privacy law? Um, and then what are the other privacy issues um, that we should be thinking about these kind of gray areas that aren't yet covered um, in existing uh, regulation? Sure. And so, you know, the, the lawmaking process is at the, at the statutory level through Congress or state legislatures is a political process. And so, you know, it's, it's slow to get done. I think that's why the law is always sort of behind. Now, regulation out of uh, agencies, uh, that's also oftentimes in response to new, new phenomena. So if we were to go back 20 years and, and have a talk about what's going on, it would be all about like consumer, 20 years ago, it would be about consumer confidence in online shopping. And now, you know, we're past that point uh, where, where everybody's online shopping. And so now we're talking about, well, okay, what is the responsibility of these organizations to privacy to, to consumers? What is the um, nature of uh, liability for uh, online companies and what should they be uh, held accountable for or not held accountable for? And you can see that in the discussion about Section 230. But one of the things that comes up a lot in discussing laws that fundamentally change how things are done in an online context is what is the residual effect of this on the internet? So the internet is a place to share information and to grow. And when a lot of the regulations that have been passed are very cognizant of that. We want this, this space to grow and not be encumbered. And if you look at any of the, not just privacy, but any kind of online regulation that has emerged in the last 20 years, whether it be net neutrality or uh, 230 reform or whatever, is you always have people out here, well, if we change the law this way, is this gonna fundamentally change the way online works? Is this gonna change how businesses are gonna be able to do business? And so I think that's part of the, it's that unknown factor. If we, you know, how is the GDPR going to affect business, you know, three years from now, four years from now, how is that gonna affect online communication? So I think that's one of those things that uh, is, is the unknown and that's always going to be part of that discussion. Now, as part of what's going on in the future, I think that you're seeing a lot of uh, like I mentioned, you see a lot of states stepping up and you have a lot of people uh, who are now in organizations that are dealing with multiple regulations because they're multinational and those standards are different. So the GDPR kind of gets imported into an American context because you're a business doing, uh, you know, worldwide business. I think there's also a, and I was reading a study just before this about, you know, how do companies change and relate to privacy? So privacy officer, the people that are designated in that position, that has grown uh, since 2018. And I think there is a recognition of what, like Kate just mentioned, about getting these different constituency groups together to talk about their corporate approach or their organization's approach, whatever it, corporate or nonprofit approach to privacy and how that's going to be handled in the context of consumers, how it's going to be handled in the context of employees, and also part of their marketing and uh, brand management strategy. So I, I think that's what's on the horizon as of now. I think also one of the things that has changed is if you look at COVID-19 and the pandemic, there's new privacy issues that are emerging, like contact tracing is a privacy issue, uh, you know, things like that. So you're going to see not just with technological change, but just global change, societal changes, is, all is interconnected with those types of privacy related issues. I completely agree. I just want to pick up the thread that you were mentioning around this, this gray area, because I, it, that feels so critical to me. Um, as we look at 
this space between the current regulations and what is going to change and adapt and get stricter within that space. And then the earlier conversation we were having around brand trust, it feels to me like there's a slightly missing piece of this puzzle that I would love for the, the rise of privacy tech to help contribute to, which is the actual dimensionalization of the business impact, which is a slightly different way of thinking about it from just the regulation and what's that going to look like and how much stricter or complicated is our business is going to have to deal with, you know, varying levels of, of the law. And it's slightly more advanced than the, just a, a blunt brand trust conversation. It's about understanding and being able to dimensionalize the growth of a business that is possible through changes to privacy. So actually being able to quantify for companies, and we're starting to see some of this research come out, but I think there's much farther that it can go to say, if you take this step ahead of the regulation, here's how your business may be impacted. You might see this level of growth in your consumer base. You might see this you know, increase in interaction. You might see a hit here or there, but actually helping to walk them through the modeling of what it could mean in a changing business dynamic, I think offers an additional and rich conversation for these gray areas. Because I think as Casey has nailed so well, we're very much in this space where it's going to continue to unfold on the regulation side quite a bit. And we need to figure out how businesses can get ahead of that conversation and figure out where they can can sort of lead on the on the ethics and on the the brand front as well. So that's something that that kind of comes up for me. Great. Um, I'm watching the chat. Um, if there's any questions from folks um, that you want to ask, um, but just make sure you put them in the chat so I can um, make sure that I ask them um, of the the team. Um, I do want to. Um, Abhishek has a question here, uh, and Kate and Casey, I would love your, your response to this. Um, he says, there's been a trend for some time now to simply collect any and all consumer data available for future marketing purposes without much thought being given to asking questions like, do we need this data to do our job or are we just collecting data because we might figure something out later? Um, this is definitely coming to the foray with edge computing where one of the core tenants is to minimize the amount of raw data that leaves devices, apps, um, and only the necessary. So would love your thoughts just on, I, I think what, what many of us have seen is a pervasive practice to just collect a lot of data uh, and try to figure out what to do with it later. It's exactly right. I would say this falls into my top two recommendations for every marketing leader out there, which is know your marketing data trails. You know, you've got your user journey map, understand your data journey map, where are you collecting data? Why, if your team is launching a new campaign, what new information are you gonna be getting? What are the practices? Being able to actually map and share that. And then two, which highlights exactly what this person was was noting in their comment, which is recognizing that more data is not more. It's a, I, I um, could not agree enough with what this commenter shared. We have a problem within the marketing industry and in growth oriented departments more generally that we our current default is that if we grab it now, we might come up with something really, really smart and clever to do with it later. But what ends up happening is we just get more and more and more and more and we lose our understanding of where our marketing data trails are, why we're collecting it, why we're using it. And that is just, that's the slippery slope that if we can tackle those two things of changing our mindset that more is not more when it comes to data, it's not gonna protect us in the future or help us grow as a company in the future and knowing exactly what we're doing with our data currently, I think that that will go a long way to having more productive conversations with the marketing departments around data privacy in general. It'll re it'll get us to a, a good level of education is, is my viewpoint. And I know Casey, we've chatted a little bit about the transparency angle of that and what it looks like to be transparent as a company and how that relates to ethics and components. And I think that sort of 
weaves into this conversation as well. I think it does as well. And I think that you're right about, you know, we're collecting organizations collect data to what end and how, how do they store it? How do they use it? And those are some of the, the areas right now where there are laws and regulations that address that. And there's a laws that do address using data in certain circumstances. And can you uh, legally use data to do certain types of promotional offerings and things like that? But it still is an area of law that is is not as uh, cohesive or as robust as is the as the field is so the field is much more developed and the law is sort of catching up and like i said before i think if we had this conversation we have a conference next year talking about this topic i think that there's going to be a there's going to be a different conversation uh and particularly if we have a conference 10 years from now talking about this topic we're going to have a different conversation right now it, because the the regulation is not as robust i think that you know maybe that's an opportunity for uh organizations to make some some decisions about transparency and about um uh, about uh storage that goes above sort of mandatory minimum legal standards yeah, and I think the fact that there is still so much uncertainty in this gray area is one of the reasons why privacy policy sucks so much, right? Because uh, lawyers are trying to future proof them um, because the business could change on a dime in terms of what they're using the, the data for. And that makes it impossible for, for us as communicators to be as transparent as we want to be. Um, because we're trying to help cover the business because tomorrow they may decide to use it for something else. And people are, I think, on one hand, understandably um, hesitant, but on the other hand, I think we need to get better at this, but hesitant to communicate frequently about data practices. And so constantly updating your um, customers and, and consumers about you're using data for this new thing today and then tomorrow you're gonna do, you know, the, I think there's legitimate concern about warning fatigue, but I think we also need to get better about not being afraid to have these conversations with consumers. If you are afraid to ask for consent, you should not be doing what you're doing. If you are afraid that people are going to say no um, to something, that should be an indicator, right? And they have every right to say no. That is what the whole point of, um, you know, privacy and respect is about, is giving people the opportunity to exercise their rights and to foster a trusted relationship uh, with your organization. And if you don't give them the opportunity to say yes or no, um, that actually hurts a lot on the reputation side. And so I, I think you're right, Casey, that, you know, as, as we mature more as an industry, I think we're going to see uh, more opportunities to build trust and strengthen reputation by having more, um, I mean, like literally transparent um, and two-way conversations with users. I, I struggle with the use of transparency in regards to privacy because telling me that you're doing a whole bunch of shitty things with my data, but not giving me control over that uh, is not actually helpful. Um, it's just a talking point for, for lawmakers. And so, you know, I, I would like to see more actual engagement. Um, but I think right now a lot of organizations are scared to have those conversations because they're not actually confident in their own data practices and they would prefer that people not know what they're doing. Well, and I would I would just say that when you're talking about regulatory aspects of this, you know, consumers are driving that. But if you look at the history of privacy over the last 100 years, 130 years in the U.S., but what drives it also is technology. So technology changes, technological innovation changes, and then there's a privacy response to that. So when we're talking about, you know, what's the future of privacy, we can speculate a little bit. That's good. To sort of anticipate, but there's some things that are unanticipatable, uh, such as, you know, what there may be a new technological innovation that is used. And so maybe establishing those base norms and the law always tries to do this where they, they take something and they, they, you know, sort of a right to privacy or, or any kind of law and try to apply it into a new scenario, providing that consistency. The same with ethical guidelines as well can, uh, you know, a transparency guidelines that can guide you forward into a, a, a new era that may be different than it is today. Right. Are there any other um, questions for for the group? I, ha I have more questions, but I just want to give folks um, time. 
I do just want to pick up on this um, thread that's happening in the chat, which I think is so interesting, which is talking about the role that regulation will play in raising the bar. And I know we've, we've touched on it quite a bit in this conversation. I just want to, to note that from my viewpoint, regulation serves as a stick for companies. I think that there is a ton of untapped potential on the carrot front but we have to do the work to show companies how it's going to benefit them. And I think the more that we attach that to consumer behavior, and it, it really dives into what you were saying, Melanie, which is around choice. A lot of companies assume that if we don't do something, it'll be fine, no one will leave us, which is true in the absence of choice. If there is choice, companies are going to actually start to see some of these actions have more consequences because consumers will look at two similar products with similar outcomes and they'll say, huh, I like the brand attributes of this company better. I like the values. I like the practices. And we see that outside of practice, outside of privacy all of the time. So that to me, I'm optimistic that that is going to flow into the privacy realm as well because um, anyone who stands at a grocery aisle and makes a decision on soda, you know, you're large part, you're making that decision based on the values of the company, your brand associations with the company, perhaps some pieces of product or flavor or texture. But the more choice there is, the more we're going to get into these components. That I think we've long been waiting for on privacy, which is something a little bit deeper than just a stick for the industry and something that offers consumers more compelling choice overall. So I am very optimistic about that. Any, Casey, any uh, last thoughts or, or comments from you as, as we wrap up here in terms of um, things things that you're optimistic about or things that you're excited to see in terms of the, the evolution and, and maturation of the field? Well, I think that privacy as a, as a concept has, a, a particularly in an online context, has a greater awareness today than it has ever before. I think there's a lot of people that who are demanding an increase in privacy because they understand how important it is for them personally. And it's just like Kate was talking about with brand value and what does a brand stand for? We know outside of the privacy context that that means quite a lot. Businesses have, have jumped onto that as a part of their reputation and brand identity and as part of their reputation management. And there's literature and, and a lot of different uh, areas about how companies have been able to leverage that for their own sort of distinguishing themselves within the, the marketplace. So I think as consumers are becoming more aware, their demands may shape policy, but their demands may also shape sort of company responses. And I think that's what Kate and was getting to earlier was, you know, is that a way to distinguish yourself in the marketplace? And as I was talking about in the first part of our discussion is that early adapters are looking for that. But that may be a trend that then transcends that that group and goes and becomes more widespread. So I think that there is um, I think that there is an increased awareness, which is good. I think there is an increased uh, regulatory response to privacy, which is, is good as well. Um, and, and as I said, we're in the state of flux. So we don't know what the future is, is going to look like. But we do know that we're moving forward a, a more um, conscientious sort of decision making about privacy uh, in, in multiple sectors. Yeah, and I think to, to that point, one of the things we often forget is that regulators are themselves also consumers. Um, they, you know, they may have specific ideas about law and um, how to dictate policy, but in terms of sentiment, um, they're not uh, completely different um, from consumers. It's it's something that um, I think we we can learn even from the adjacent cybersecurity field, where uh, you know a lot of you know things like robocalls and um, identity theft, like a lot of those laws went into effect because regulators got annoyed. They got pissed because it had personal impact on them. Uh, and I think we're starting to see some of that happen on the privacy side as well. As you can imagine you know, what these lawmakers and, and regulators um, have that they would like to, to keep private, right? And thinking about the, the impact that, I mean, we, we've seen that 
a lot uh, in terms of the impact for, for governments um, when sensitive information is, is made public. So um, completely agree with uh, uh, Kate's optimism as well as uh, Casey's eagerness um, for, for new developments. Um, we're going to end there. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for the discussion um, and for the questions in the chat. Um, real quick, Kate and Casey, what's the, the best way for, for folks to reach you if they want to engage after today? Uh, feel free to just shoot me an email. I'm kate at transcend.io. Yeah, same here. MC Myers at VTU. Great. And for me, uh, best is to hit me up on LinkedIn or on Twitter. I'm at imelanie spelled very phonetically. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your uh, summit today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.